Okay. You can hear me, right, Cam? Can you hear me, Cam? I can. Can you hear me? Yes, we're good. Okay. Sorry we're late, guys, but uh, we were going to start at the top of the hour, last hour, but I had a knock on the door, and there was a woman. She was pregnant, and she was about to give birth, and I had to stop everything and help her. And everything went well. It was a, a bouncing baby boy. I weighed, um, I weighed myself, and, the, and then I had the baby uh, um, dripping in, you know, that gushy stuff. But I weighed it, and it was a big, big boy, 8 pounds, 11 ounces. And uh, the woman was so grateful, she, um, she called the baby Pine Creek. <laughs> 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 so that's why we were late. Uh, but we're going to uh, review a video, uh, Dr. Primrose. Primrose? <laughs> Pinrose. <laughs> I don't know why. Is that a, um, uh, what do you call it, a Freudian slip for some reason? No, I don't know. I don't think so. But I want to start it. I'm, we're not going to play the whole thing, I don't think. But I want to start it with, um, with William Lane Craig telling his testimony. Roger gave his uh, sort of background, and he's never been raised, born, he was born and raised in a non-Christian family, a non-theistic family, but William Lane Craig, um, well, here's his story. I, I, I've been playing this for a reason, and I, let me know if you don't hear it. Some other philosophical arguments. Yes, I, interestingly, my background sounds rather similar to Roger's in terms <laughs> of my upbringing. I think you were actually more involved in church activities <laughs> than I was. Um, my parents were at best nominal uh, Christians, but we never attended church. Um, but when I became a teenager, I began... Oh, and by the way, thank you. This, uh, the audio is good. Bob, I've sorry, I, my apologies. A thousand pine points to you. I'm sorry, my mind's a little distracted from the baby birth and all that sort of thing. But a thousand pine points to you for being here first. And to ask what I call the big questions in life. Who am I? Why am I here? What's the meaning of my existence? And as I looked at the universe, I could see no meaning to my existence. I knew that humanity would eventually perish um, in the heat death of the universe, and I could see no reason for its existence, for the existence of human beings, and in particular for my existence. And I simply faced an inevitable death in which... An inevitable death. This, in my opinion, folks, and I could be wrong, is why William Lane Craig is a Christian today. It's not because of any philosophical arguments for God. It's because he had this existential angst. He was scared of death. And this is a pretty common reason for a lot of people. Which I would cease to exist. And so for me, it, were, it was these big, deep existential philosophical questions that eventually, through the witness of a girl who sat in front of me in my high school German class, led me to... Isaiah uh, Schmucker uh, Fräulein... A uh, girl <laughs> <laughs> is another the second reason besides the existential angst. It was the sehr uh, gut a kleine uh, uh, Fräulein who caught the eye of William Lane Craig's heart. Do you understand? Did, did that, that was the pretty good German, right? The happy, the happy German, yeah. <laughs> In the, infect, the infectious, frustrating, happy German girl. Okay. By the way, look at the face uh, here of, of Roger. Should, can I call him Roger? Is that you think that's okay? I think you have to call him Sir, don't you? Oh, I'll call him Sir, Sir Roger. Um, throughout th this is going to be the theme of this video. Throughout this video, I get the impression if I could get inside Sir Roger's head is like this guy is boring me. William Lane Craig is boring me. It's like I don't. Why am I here? It's almost like what I'm, I'm seeing going through his head. But anyhow faith in Christ. And as a Christian, to finally get to your question, mm -hmm. Justin, it's important for me to have a synoptic worldview. Mm -hmm. That is to say, a worldview that includes a Christian perspective on all of the different facets of uh, human learning, uh, whether it be the sciences, literature, uh, art, um, psychology, history, philosophy and the deep metaphysical questions. So you're correct. When I wrote my doctoral dissertation on the Kalam cosmological argument under 
John Hick at the University of Birmingham, one of the things I began to explore was whether there might not be some sort of scientific confirmation for um, the... Because wouldn't that be just dandy and nice if there was actually some scientific confirmation for the God he happens to love and serve? Claim of the Kalam cosmological argument that the universe began to exist. And I was startled to see the degree to which um, contemporary astrophysics did support this premise in no... He was startled, Cam. He was actually surprised that there was evidence for the God he loved and cherished. Lo, lo and behold. <laughs> lo and behold, yes. Small I was looking because... for it and I found it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you, I'm not sure if it's occurring in the live stream, Doug, but you're echoing back slightly to me when you're unmuted. Ah, okay. I know the problem. Ooh. The problem is I am just ramped up and got the volume high. Okay, be prepared to hear a ding. Because of Professor Penrose's mm. work uh, on the singularity theorems. So that is an important part of my worldview as a Christian. And, and hence why you've been engaging with Roger's work really. Okay, I'm going to fast forward it here. I don't really think there's anything important until we get to the first question, main question. Uh, do you agree with Hawking? This is a question to Dr. Roger, or Sir Roger. Do you agree with Hawking that there probably is no God? Let me back it up a little bit there. About, um, or at least as an explanation of the universe. Did, how far did you agree with your former colleague on, on that? Well, you see, there's a huge irony in all this, of course, which is my view about the origin of the universe. And I remember hearing there was a bit on the... Uh, there was new book of Stephen's posthumous... Posthumously book. published, yeah. yes. Which ha and, and there's a chapter in which he talks about the uh, origin and, and the Big Bang, and I thought it was the most unconvincing part of the whole thing. Mm. So, uh, well, you see, the huge irony here is that I've changed my mind on all this. So the singularity theorems were... So, uh, so Roger changed his mind, and he now is a theist. He believes in God, and he became a Baptist, I heard. <laughs> and, and the rest of the video is just William Lane Craig and Justin uh, Briley uh, and him just talking about Jesus and their love for Jesus. So that's it. We're done. See you later, guys. <laughs> we're all, we're all, we're all. As, as you described, these were confirmation <clears throat> of this singular origin. And the word singular has to be explained here. It means a place where essentially where your equations go to infinity and you have to give up. Or in other words, it's where your equations cease, cease to work mm. and, and, uh, and the, they stop telling you <laughs> what to do, if you like. Um, and the idea is you go, we take observations about the expansion of the universe and the equations of Einstein and try to extrapolate backwards and use general theorems which show that you really can't evade the singular origin. So mm. that's where things the equations blow up and you have to you can't rely on the equations to give you any tell you what what happened at the beginning mm, state mm. and Stephen has a particular way of looking at that which uh, is an interesting way I, I don't think it works myself he developed an idea with James Hartle an, an American who in California uh, very very interesting man and I think the idea is a very interesting one but uh, I have some problems with it. You have some major reservations. Yes, but the the main thing is that my current view is that the Big Bang, although it existed, there was a Big Bang, was not the beginning. Mm. <gasps> what did he say, Cam? The Big Bang, in his opinion, was not the beginning? Not the beginning, <laughs> dum, of, dum, dum. Not the beginning of what? Our universe? It was definitely the beginning of our expansion of our universe, right? I think he means the cosmos. Yeah. Okay, this is something I wish uh, the um, Christians from Alabama that come on my show can get through their heads. <laughs> that <laughs> the Big Bang is not the beginning of our universe. It's the beginning of the expansion of our universe. It says nothing about, about the beginning of the cosmos or what, uh, what happened prior, if that even makes sense. I think... It, after listening to this the first time, Cam, I actually think the term prior does make sense uh, prior to the Big Bang, even though time, 
our time started uh, at the Big Bang. Yeah, well, according to uh, which we'll, he'll talk about later, um, if we let it play, um, his idea of cyclic conformal um, cosmology, there are there is a prior to the Big Bang, like you say. I wish I could speed this up, guys. I really do, but it looks like I can't. Even though you see this one point, hey, hang on. Oh, I can. Excellent, because he talks really slow. I sorry, Sir Roger, but you need to be sped up. Okay, here we go. <laughs> and back so to what you was... saying... oh, go ahead. Back to what you're saying before, though, Doug. Uh, to give some um, leeway to these uh, these Christian folks you're talking about, um, even cosmologists do sometimes use the word Big Bang to refer to a beginning of time. So really, it's yeah, they do. Yeah, they well, it but gets used. In two senses like one which like you accurately described like the the early expansion of our universe but given these theorems that um that roger is talking about these singularity theorems uh many physicists who um have a great investment in general relativity uh think that uh these general relativity theorems tell us that the universe actually did have a beginning at that point in time or like you know at this uh big bang phase jd goodwin says the beginning of the universe is the beginning of time how in the hell can there be a before when time didn't exist well but it's how you define time right jd like it's our time <laughs> that sounds like a some type of beer slogan it's our time <laughs> grab a beer and no it's um i think later on in this uh, sir roger explains how there can still be temporal before and after, even though um, there's no metric of time. Does that make sense what I just said? Well, yeah, I think I think I understood what you mean. And also, uh, Penrose's model is not the only one. Um, there are other um, uh, cosmologies that include quantum mechanics, where um, the Big Bang wasn't the beginning of time either. Okay, well, let's play. Something prior to the Big Bang. But if you like, the reasons, original reasons for my thinking about this are a bit like the kind of thing you're talking about, um, about what the universe is for, why, what's it doing, and kind of that kind of question. Mm. Shall I go into that? Well, let's that leave it for the moment, moment yes, because I, I do want to go into you yes, know, think, where you are now yes, with sure, your cosmology, sure, which is yeah. utterly fascinating and mind-bending at some level. But, but maybe we should start at, at a more sort of fundamental level, uh, because I, I quoted in my introduction from a, a quote of yours. I'll read it out in full now. Uh, <laughs> you say, there's a certain sense in which I would say the universe has a purpose. It's not there just somehow by chance. Some people take the view that the universe is simply there and it runs along. It's a bit as though it just sort of computes and we happen by accident to find ourselves in this thing. I don't think that's a very fruitful or helpful way of looking at the universe. I think there's something much deeper about it, about its existence, which we have very little inkling of. At or maybe, Justin, it's just too painful to think of it that way. And you, it's harder for you to find meaning and purpose in life if that's the way it is the moment and you've obviously written as well at length and spoken of the fact that you you see that there's there's a sort of th three ways in which you can look at reality the mental the physical the abstract and and in some sense you actually believe there is more to this reality than simply the physical aspect that many people many of your atheist colleagues would say well that's that's all that ultimately exists here mm -hmm. roger do you want to just begin by sort of spelling spelling that out what your worldview is in that sense okay before he spells out his worldview i actually think remember i had uh, nomad on the other day cam and and I made I made a, a video spoofing him or basically mocking him the, the way he talked and everything. I actually think that Nomad's philosophy is similar to Roger here, uh, Sir Roger, what he's about to say. Now, correct me if I'm wrong after you listen to this, but I think I think it's similar because I think Nomad has like four worlds or four realms, and Doc, uh, Sir, Sir Roger has three. Maybe put up that graphic um, that I sent you if you have it available, Doug. Which one? The one that describes the picture that Roger's going to talk about now. Oh, he's not going to talk about his CCC model right yet, just yet. No, the the first one with like the the three kind of spheres all connected to each other. Uh, hang on. Uh, boop, boop. Okay, found it. Okay, so this is Sir Roger's worldview. You want to talk through it? 
So this graphic comes from his book, The Road to Reality. It's a book that like teaches you mathematics. It's really interesting, but it's pretty technical. I never got through it, <laughs> maybe like halfway or something. But um, I actually can't see what you have. Up, so maybe I'll just bring it up myself. Um, but yeah, he has these three spheres that are connected to each other. And um, he's showing how um, only a subset of each of these spheres connects with the other. So in the mathematical world pictured at the top, there's only a subset of that mathematical world that maps onto the physical world. And he shows that by showing a little circle leading to the physical world. And then of the physical world, there's only a subset of that that has a mental component to it that is like our conscious brains. And of the mental world, it's only a subset of our mental life that um, is engaged with this, you know, mathematical platonic realm. And that's, I think, what he's trying to picture. And he's trying to offer some type of explanation for this mystery of how they, these two sort of aspects of the world are connected to each other. Okay, now let's hear him talk about it. Well, you mentioned what, when you say my world, you, you mentioned the three worlds, which mm. I often use to describe. Like These are things also, the three mysteries, if mm. you like. Well, one of these, you say they, there's the physical world, you know, things like tables and so on, and what we think of as, as the physical world, although it's not quite clear when we go deeply into what's going on, <laughs> what that really means, but never mind about that. The physical world, and then there's the mental world, that's our experiences, consciousness, um, feelings about things, so mm. on. And then there's what you call the abstract world. I would be more specific about that. It's a mathematical abstraction. So we're thinking about um, how it is. That, well, let me secondly explain the mysteries, you see. Go ahead. Mm. Mystery number one is the fact that this world of physics seems to depend so extraordinarily precisely. And the more we explore it, the more precise we see this is. Uh, it's so precisely guided by physical... By Sorry, mathematical equations. Mm. So we have these mathematical, let's not just say equations, that's a bit too specific, mathematical principles, yes. which, which govern in such a precise way the way this physical world operates. Mm. And there is, if you like, a huge mystery. I'm calling it a mystery. These things, we're never quite sure whether... <laughs> is, is this what Eugene Wigner famously yes. spoke of as the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics? It just seems to be a, exactly. an extraordinarily remarkable fact that mathematics, it's, that, that the universe seems to be written in that language and we, that we can discover it. That's exactly it, yes. Mm. yes. And the more we, we know about how things operate, I mean, now there's... Such ex okay, I, my main question is, very um, simple question, is why does he need these three realms to begin with um, instead of just one? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that he would argue, if I recall correctly, that um, that it isn't clear that um, any of these realms can be explained in virtue of reference to the other. So I think he would say that it doesn't appear there's a satisfactory explanation about how consciousness is purely physical. And it doesn't appear that there is an explanation that that um, accounts for how the, the mathematical world is purely mental. Um, and equally, it doesn't seem to be the case that the mathematical world is, uh, or that the physical world is purely mathematical. Um, and so he's, he, I think that he's sort of stuck in this place where he doesn't see how any of these realms can be reduced to the other. Yeah, um, I, I, I get that. But I, why not just say there's the physical realm and thing, things like mathematics is a property of the universe. It's just brute fact. And, um, and consciousness is an emergent property of our brains, which is matter. And that's just the way it is. <laughs> to me, that seems a pretty simple exp explanation. But I guess for a lot of people, that just doesn't suff suffice for them. Well, so I think he's open-minded to both of those things, although on the first one, with respect to mathematics, I think the difficulty that he has is that it appears that we um, discover mathematics in some manner, and that mathematics isn't necessarily something that's related to the physical world. So, for example, it turned out that complex numbers were intra, uh, integral to understanding the physical world, in particular in quantum mechanics. But there are other mathematical structures, for example, like the Mandelbrot set or something like that, which, while it appears to exist um, in some sense within mathematics, it doesn't appear to have any relation to the physical world. Um, and then, but on the second part of it, um, that, 
the the physical uh, i actually lost train of thought but that's, that's right uh t jumps in the chat he says penrose thinks that uh mathematical objects exist independently yeah yeah he thinks that we're discovering mathematics in some way so like he wouldn't take that point of view that but, they're just like but, mental constructs but how is it how is discovering mathematics different than discovering a rock on mars like it's just a piece of our universe it's a, or a property of our universe or yeah anyhow i'm going to keep playing extraordinary precision there are in measurements well Einstein's general relativity is, is very, very precisely mm. determined. And laws of quantum mechanics and how they inter interrelate with, um, well, even, even with gravity in some respects. I mean, how clocks, Einstein, one of the Einstein's predictions is that a clock up, up high will run more slowly than one down here. Mm. And these, this precision in that, I'm sorry, I got it the wrong way around. I know what <laughs> you mean, yes. That, the, the, the precision is, is, is extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. The precision, you know, even, even from, from down here to maybe a, center, a centimeter above, and they can measure the difference. Yes. So the, these are extraordinarily precise. Now, um, okay, it just shows that the mathematical theories, when we really understand them and when, when we get them right, they're still not quite right, that's clear. Uh, but nevertheless, the precision is extraordinary. So that's mystery number one. Mystery number two is how is it that conscious experience mm. can arise when these circumstances seem to be right. Now, it doesn't seem to be probably, <laughs> I can't, I'm just guessing, but I don't think it's present in that glass or in the water or in the glass. <laughs> uh -huh. But nevertheless, it seems to come about with certainly with human beings and I think with other animals. I don't think it's unique to human Certain beings. Certain brain structures somehow seem to give rise to yes. you. To this and there is a genuine mystery, mm. I think, and it's not just a matter of you know compu complicated comp computations. There's something mm. much more subtle going on. Mm. So that's mystery number two, and mystery number three is our ability to use our conscious understanding to comprehend mathematics mm. and these very uh, extraordinary, uh, and self-consistent but deep ideas, which are mm. very far from our experiences. So that's the how we how we comprehend mathematics, if you and, like. And in that sense, you you believe that mathematics, for instance, is discovered rather than invented by Absolutely. us. In that sense, it, it exists yes. independently. Yes, of right. Us. Yes. And 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 one of those great mysteries, as you say, is the fact that we can access it. Seems yes. itself a remarkable feat of of reality. That's right, because it's so indirectly connected with our. Like I can just tell guys like William Lane Craig, they salivate when they hear atheists talk like this because they think there's a chance we can lead them to Jesus. Uh, our uh, existence and what you know, how we get along in the world, and nat how natural selection has helped us to to survive and so on. It's, it's really hard to see how these things come about from, from well, that. There's there's three big mysteries there to, yep. to kick us off with. Bill, what's your response to some of these huge? huge well, areas? I want to say first and foremost that one of the most exciting things about uh, Roger's thinking is this deep metaphysical vision of reality that he has. It's in such contrast to the sort of positivistic and verificationistic uh, pronouncements of many scientists uh, who think that philosophy is dead uh, and that these metaphysical questions are meaningless. Mm -hmm. Roger is engaged in questions that are not simply physical or scientific. These are metaphysical mm -hmm. questions. And I think that the fund... See, like, you can tell William Lane Craig's getting excited. It's like, he's evangelizing here. To him, this is evangelism. And I think same with Justin. The fundamental issue that is raised by this tripartite metaphysics is the ancient philosophical problem of the one and the many. Mm. That is to say, what is the underlying unity of these three seemingly disparate realms of reality, the mental, the abstract, and the physical? Um, these realms of reality are so different, so causally unconnected, it seems. Okay, this is the part where I think Curtis Nomad <clears throat> this is what he's trying to get out of his brain and is uh, and is unable to do so. But what William Lane Craig is saying right now, I think is what um, Nomad, the guy who uh, debated um, uh, Tom Jump the other day, is what he was trying to say. That one wonders what is the underlying unity for mm -hmm. all of these. So how are these three realms related? For example, the mathematical abstract realm cannot be the source of the physical or conscious mental realm because abstract objects by definition are causally a feat. That's part of what it means to be an abstract object. The number seven, for example, has no effect upon anything. Mm. So the abstract realm cannot provide the source of unity. Could it be the physical realm that provides the source? Well, Rogers already mentioned the second mystery. How does the physical give rise to consciousness, particularly mm. intentionality? The intentionality is the aboutness of... I think... I think the HBO show uh, Westworld, they solved the consciousness problem. <laughs> our 
mental states. I can think about my summer vacation. No physical object has intentionality. Mm. So the mental is difficult to derive from the physical, and the abstract, it seems to me, is impossible mm. because the Cam, if you're going to be my wig man, you gotta you gotta smile faster. <laughs> mathematical realm is characterized by necessity. These are logically necessary truths, and by its plenitude. There are infinite realms of mathematical objects. And the physical realm, by contrast, is contingent uh, and therefore cannot ground these logical and mathematical truths. And it's plausibly finite as well. So the physical can't Mm. be the support. Now, what about the mental? Could the mental be the source of these other two realms? Well, in mental causation, we do have the experience of the mental causing physical changes Mm. in our brain. I can will to get up Mm. uh, or to speak. And wind can cause a rock to fall off a mountain. What if consciousness is not too much different than that? Similarly, many philosophers... Is that that too deep? Or is it too simple? So simple it's deep? (laughs) Yes, I think he's presuming a lot um, when he says claims like that it can't be the case that that intentional states arise from physical states, or it can't be the the case that... um, that these mental causes are simply arising from like an underlying physical law. Um, But that's his view, of course. Yeah. I have thought that the abstract realm is not really a separate realm that exists by itself, but they are ideas in the mind of uh, of consciousness. Hmm. Oh, oh, did you hear what? I, I can't. He almost said God there. Listen, I think I'm right about this. Realm is not really a separate realm that exists by itself, but it, 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 they are ideas in the mind of, uh, of consciousness. <laughs> he was going to say in the mind of g- consciousness. That they uh, are the, the result of intellection mm. by a mind. Now, the problem is that no human mind could be the source of the abstract realm because of its plenitude and necessity, whereas we are contingent and finite. So what I want to invite Roger <laughs> to comment on is why couldn't the mental realm include an infinite consciousness? That is to say, an omniscient mind which has created the physical realm and which is the source of the abstract mathematical realm. This would solve the problem of the one and the many and give you an underlying unity for this um, tripartite metaphysic that you affirm. And, and what you've just described sounds suspiciously like God. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, but... <laughs> it did sound suspiciously like that, yes. Roger, what do you say to that? Well, you see, you're putting it as an interesting... Uh... You're putting it in in the mental world, if you like, whereas I tend to put it in the in the in the, in the platonic mathematical world. You see, mm. that that I don't quite see why. Uh, I mean, how do you drive the precision? You see, just a, a mental thing doesn't seem to me. But I, I don't quite see why it helps, if you like. I mean, you can postulate a, a super mental. Okay, this is the theme of this video. I don't see why positing a God helps. And I've been saying this for a while because I, I, I remember guys like Jonathan McClatchy saying, you know, look how complex DNA is and how evolution is, how it works. And it, it seems like there's a designer behind it who's or guider guiding it and so forth. But how? How does this help you? How, is this, how does this explain anything? Well, because God is all powerful and he can just do it. Well, how, what do you mean he can just do it? How? What explanational explanatory power does bringing a infinite consciousness bring to the table and i think this is uh, the what guys like sir roger is thinking throughout this whole thing it's like it's almost like uh to put it in valley girl talk it's like cool story bro it's like (laughs) um Mm. (laughs) you disagree no i agree i think and i think that there's this difficulty that Craig's view um, seems to make more sense if we imagine that we were some direct special creation from God, but yet all the evidence appears to, which, by the way, I think is part of the reason why uh, Craig sees such a distinction between human beings and other life forms, yes. um, which comes up a little later in the discussion. But um, but I, I think that this this fact that it appears humans were created by this extended process of biological evolution and that our faculties appear to have come about in this fashion, I think is a major problem for the story that mental is somehow fundamental because otherwise, why is it that a natural physical process 
was required to bring about beings that exhibit this behavior that causes us to posit a um, or causes Craig to posit an underlying mental world in the first place. Yeah, whenever guys like William Lane Craig bring up consciousness or any theist bringing up consciousness as a reason for God uh, or morality even, I talk about bonobos, talk about chimpanzees, talk about orangutans, talk about the zoo, talk about... What we're seeing in the zoo, do you apply, are you consistent? Do you apply that these animals have consciousness um, at the same level as us? Do they have moral actions like us? And is it just because we can vocalize things that it makes us special? Because I think once they can go down the line of primates, they might say, oh, we're just a more advanced version of that. And so maybe consciousness is not as special as we think. But I don't know. I guess consciousness is still special whatever it is being or something i mean does it have a mental existence without a physical one is that the idea yes so yes there and so that some, this uh, mental this this mind this yeah, omniscient mind has created a contingent physical realm yeah and is the source of the conceptual realm as well i can't quite see well you could say that it contains all that because it's so infinite that it contains <laughs> the entire see, um, mathematical world yes I, d I don't think that um penrose really like pressed that point but He's making a really interesting point there that uh, the minds that we are aware of, ours and, you know, our fellow human beings, um, these are contingent things that appear to be like more products of the physical or at least in part products of the physical. Yet we're supposing that behind it all is this non-physical mind and um, our minds appear to be uh, delicately dependent upon the physical in that if, for example, you put a stake through your brain, <laughs> you know, you uh, die. Um, but if you manipulate the brain in very specific ways, you also alter people's personalities and conscious experience. Um, so there appears to be this very strong connection between the physical and the mental. But yet this new mind that is being posited to explain things. No, it's wholly different. In fact, it's not even dependent upon the physical at all. It created the physical. Yeah. Yeah, I I'm um I, I got a package in from Amazon today and it's um pills. And to show you that consciousness is really mind de uh, brain dependent, uh it says here you take two pills a day and after a week you become a Mormon. <laughs> you can actually change your belief system based on taking certain chemicals. So um but does it where does it come from? What's it uh... Well, it would have to be metaphysically necessary in order to be the source of yes. broadly logically necessary mathematical it's... truths, and I would say other sorts of... Did he say it has to be? Let me rewind that. Metaphysically necessary. Makes sense. Um, but does it... Where does it come from? What's it's, uh... Well, it would have to be metaphysically necessary in order to be the source of yes. broadly logically necessary mathematical it's... truths, and I would say other <laughs> sorts of truths, ethical truths that are plausibly necessary. Yes, it's very curious. You see, you have the mental world sort of being a necessary, right? And I have the mathematical world somehow being uh, being a necessity yeah. because it's somehow. <laughs> well, I, 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 I... yeah, and, and isn't it curious that he's a mathematician and he's and Craig's a philosopher? Isn't it curious how <laughs> what's necessary <laughs> is based on your occupation? You know, yeah. Well, and so here's the other thing is that, like, if you're willing to bestow upon this, you know, underlying mental reality, God, this property of being the necessary thing, and all other examples of things that are mental that we have, that is our conscious minds, are contingent things, then why is it that you're willing to make the special move in the game and give necessity as a property to, uh, well, whether or not it's a property, but you give this property of necessity to God that you won't give to physical uh, things and this comes up later where he says that all physical things are contingent and so it couldn't be the case that the universe itself is necessary because it's composed of physical things I, I, somehow. Appreciate, <laughs> yes. I appreciate the necessity mm. but the problem is that the abstract realm has no causal powers mm -hmm. these are causally a feat objects that never come into contact with things physically they can't move them or shove them or pull them they exert no forces they are not minds and so they can't make decisions to cause things they're not causal agents so it seems to me that so th this is where i think that craig's uh, view of the abstract world um is like 
is not imaginative enough. So within physics, we have these models um, that are uh, mathematical objects or entities, and within them, they have a causal structure. For example, within these like block-like universe type cosmologies, where t time is a static thing, just in the same way as we have directions in space. Now in these cosmologies, the structure within the mathematical object actually contains within it causes and it has events and it has uh, temporal proceedings and followings and it it has structure that looks like causal things so when craig says that these abstract objects cannot have causal powers yes it might be the case that the abstract object can't cause anything outside of itself but internal to the structure of the abstract abstract object can be events and can be causes and I think that Craig doesn't really understand this point of view. Uh, positing the abstract realm as fundamental is causally inadequate, and what one would gain from what I'm proposing would be a solution to these three <laughs> mysteries. It would give explanatory depth to your worldview. I don't quite see how it explains anything. Um, I mean, does it? I mean, you're talking from a perspective of a religious person, and therefore, one's thinking of this as somehow, I mean, specific religions are much more specific than... than right, and that's why I, I grimaced a bit when you said from a religious <laughs> perspective. Yes. It's a philosophical perspective, but... Okay, it, okay. It no, I'm happier with that, because then, uh, you see, this is what I have more trouble if one's trying to make... He's happier with that, but it's still, how does philosophy help explain these mysteries? Like, doesn't it just push the mystery back to a realm or push it back to a god, in William Lane Craig's case. Um, why can't these guys say, I don't know, instead of coming up with realms or coming up with gods? Well, to be clear, that actually is Penrose's view. He considered the he considers these quote unquote mysteries to be things that he hasn't been able to resolve. And I think that he is more content, and this comes up a bit later, with leaving them as open questions as opposed to Craig, who feels the need to actually underlie uh, sorry to explain it with some type of underlying metaphysics yeah. that he can't tell whether or not it's true. Yeah, I agree. That I, I'm, I'm, if I was a betting man, I would say um, that Sir Roger is way more open to having his mind changed than a guy like William Lane Craig. Uh, however, he still made that model, right, with three, those three spheres and, and how they interact. And he's trying to solve a problem by making that model. Uh, I guess I can't blame him for, you know, trying to do stuff like that, but... Well, no, to be clear, that model I don't think is an attempt of an explanation of how things work. Uh, I think that that was his form of indicating that there is this... Uh, right, the this ontology of it, right? Yeah, I think he's trying to say, like, well, it's clearly the case that there are things that are mathematical. It's clearly the case that there are things that are physical and clearly the case that there are things that are mental. But there is this problem of understanding how each one of them um, can be explained when neither seems to be able to be explained by one or the other. Yeah, one but when you other. start defining mental different than physical or or mathematical different than physical, that's where I'm kind of like, on what basis can you... S Basically, I'm I'm questioning um, what is it? What do you call it? Pl um, pl Platonism. Um, yeah, well, those are open problems in philosophy, and like even folks, for example, that it would be more aligned with you, like naturalists, I think generally concede that there's no certainty. Oh, I'm not a naturalist, Cam, oh. because I'm open to miracles. <laughs> right, but. You're, you seem to be defaulting to a position that the mental is going to be explained by the physical. Yeah, because I've never seen a mental that's not attached to a brain. So, Right, and I think that that's a good argument. There's like an inductive case to be made that like, you know, there is the strong connection between the physical and the mental and all open problems that have been resolved have been uh, explained by reference to um, the natural or physical. Okay, let's get back to the evangelism here. It's specific in, in certain directions uh, as regards one religion or another. But if it's just such an abstract notion, it's not that I'm necessarily unhappy with it, except I don't know what to do with it because it's, it's mm. so vague. 
Mm. That's interesting. I, think that's my I mean, just just for my benefit, yes. this this abstract realm of mathematical objects and and so on. Yes, you you say it's there. It's a mystery. Why it's there? How? No, it's I there. Didn't, wasn't calling that the no. mystery. Yes, see, the mysteries are the connections. I like right. to draw this picture okay. with the three worlds. Yes. You see, mm. the worlds are there. The mysteries are the connections between right. the worlds. So, mystery number one was how somehow out of a small part of this mathematical mm. totality. Uh, we see physical laws. And it's only a very small part. I mean, mm. you look at a, any old journal, pretty well mathematical mm. journal, you see it's full of things, I'm talking about pure mathematics, mm. it's full of things which don't, certainly don't purport to have any connection whatsoever with the physical world. I mean, some, some of those seem to have, and mm. it seems to be a very tiny part mm. of that world, which is, has to do with the operation of the physical world. So that's one of the mysteries. And then the next mystery is why it is that it's a very small part of what we call the physical world, organized in, the, in just a very specific way, comes about very rarely. Mm. <laughs> I mean, all these planets around, well, how many of them actually do we think has, has life of any sort in it? Conscious life? That's a huge question. Yeah. But anyway, whatever, it's a very tiny part of that which gives rise to mentality. Just right, to be clear, Doug, um, mine is not at 1.3 times, so <laughs> I think that like when you speed it up, it makes it, it makes, it, it's not speeding it up for me, only for the audience. Oh, so are you seeing it lag and then catch up to me or what's happening then? Yeah, my one is just like playing part of the content and then it stops and skips forward and then stops and skips forward. Oh, yeah. Okay. I can't do that then. Which I think has been going on for a while, which might have meant that I was interrupting in weird places. <laughs> well, people, I'm sure, in the live stream chat were just assuming that you're um, just uh, inter a weird person interrupting in weird places. <laughs> <laughs> well, good but thing I that we have a different explanation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll bring it back down to 1x, even though I, it's painful for me to listen to anything at 1x. But anyhow, here we go. And then it's a very tiny part of our mentality. I mean, even mathematicians don't spend the whole time thinking about mathematics. They have other, <laughs> other activities which, you know, they go to the movies sometimes. They have a love life, uh, some of them at least. And uh, So when Bill Sutt tries to solve that mystery by saying, well, what, what if there is an underlying explanation to it? It's, it's all contained within a divine mind. Um, what, well, you, that's you, putting, you, it's you putting find it the difficult. divine mind in one of these worlds, you see, which yes, I find a little bit... Yeah. I find that a little bit... Uh, um, well, not just asymmetrical. I just find it not very explanatory. Put it like. Why? <laughs> oh, I can tell that this really offends guys like William Lane Craig. It's like your idea of a deity doesn't explain much for me. Sorry, guys. Why not? Why? Why do you find that this this doesn't? Well, if you just say, oh, well, there is there is a, a, a somehow a, a super mentality and uh, and it can do anything. I don't know. What oh, I don't know. Well, that's, what, that's yeah, a I think I, okay. I would okay. need to have more of an explanation about. about he can't do anything, Sir Roger. He can't sin. But exactly. Well, for example, take uh, mystery number one: the yes. applicability of mathematics. I think this is a huge issue. Because on Platonism, you have this abstract, atemporal, non-spatial realm of causally effete objects, and the physical world happens to operate according to certain mathematical principles that yeah. you've described. And as uh, Mary Leng, who is a philosopher of mathematics at the University of Liverpool, has said, on Platonism, the applicability of mathematics to the physical world is, is a happy coincidence, <laughs> which just seems incredible. By contrast, we know that minds can design things. And the view that there is an omniscient uh, mind who has designed the physical world on the mathematical blueprint that it had in mind is a very ancient perspective that goes back to Middle Platonism and people like Philo of Alexandria, who said that the intelligible world, the intelligible cosmos, exists first in the mind of the logos, the, the divine intellect, and then is instantiated in the physical world uh, by the logos who creates the world on this blueprint. And that seems to me to be uh, a good solution to the one and the many problem. I think it's that you call it a solution. I, the trouble is, it's, it's, I think it, my problem is it's too vague. I don't see how you can do much with this particular view. You see, we, 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 when it comes to the explanation of how a physical world operates in terms of mathematics, it's extraordinarily precise. Mm. And, and one can say an awful lot about that. 
but a statement like the one you mm -hmm. make here worries me because it's you, know, you can call it a solution, but it doesn't tell us very much. Well, I don't but know what <laughs> oh, but for Sir Roger doesn't <laughs> doesn't realize that for guys like William and Craig, it means everything because, and this is why I purposely played William Lane Craig's intro at the beginning of this video, his t personal testimony, without this explanation, he he would suck the sweet, sweet steel of that revolver, I think. He needs this belief to have meaning, purpose, uh, hope. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, so I think for Sir Roger to say, sorry, your, your idea of a God just doesn't help anything, doesn't explain anything. It's like a dagger in the heart to the, to guys like William Lane Craig. Yeah, it's so weird how sold uh, William Lane Craig is on this idea of ultimate meaning. Like this, it has to be this um, that that the meaning you have in your life is given to you by some ultimate metaphysical reality. It can't be just that you like things. <laughs> it can't be that you just like prefer playing hockey over playing football. <laughs> but Cam, you're a sh you're a shallow man. You know, just you just like things. Like, you, what do you got? You like your skateboard. William Lane Craig is thinking about the deep, uh, meaningful, purposeful things in life. What so I, the mystery. I don't even know what it, why you say that. <laughs> is it because it's very hard? Oh, that I think was important. What we just missed you can call it a solution but it doesn't tell us very much well I don't but even it know what solves my, the mystery I don't even know yeah it, he said it solves the mystery it doesn't what do you mean it doesn't tell us much it solves all the problems i have with my existential angst sir roger how dare you say it doesn't solve anything <laughs> well i mean specifically i think that he was saying it solves those mysteries that Penrose was positing as being in need of an explanation earlier on. Right, but which William Lane Craig agrees with, like things like consciousness and where abstract ideals come from and so forth. <laughs> this reminds me a bit of the debate between William Lane Craig and Sean Carroll, uh, where Sean points out that one of the difficulties with theistic hypotheses in comparison with what scientists or at least cosmologists are used to is that they are... Um, vague and they it's very hard to get like concrete predictions out of them the the predictions are almost like put in by fear like you just say it explains this <laughs> um it's 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 almost like this thing that you just keep adding properties to and you just keep saying that it explains all of these mysteries actually i want to say um as an aside <clears throat> your internet connection is very good cam cam's in new zealand right now and for a third world country your internet's really really good Hey, fuck you, dude. <laughs> Is it because it's very hard to then investigate yeah. this this explanation itself? That you like, there's a mystery disprove, behind the mysteries. You you need to be able to say, uh, how could you contradict such a view? You see, it's it's so oh. so vague in a way. I mean, why wasn't there a, 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 a mind which was in some malicious? Well, maybe it is malicious. I don't know. We we don't. Um, it's just saying it's a mind without telling us. Right. I haven't said anything about yes. the moral properties of this. Okay. Um, they talk about morality a little bit here. I, uh, from my notes, it's extremely boring. So I'm going to fast forward. Just oh, hold, on, hold on. I haven't talked about the moral properties. Just wait what I can explain with those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I, William Craig, William Lane Craig has answers to everything. So don't you worry, Christians, if you're doubting, just buy his book, books. Okay, here we go. This is where I think it gets a little more interesting. Thing there, which is uh, not explained by. But I mean, this is a. It goes into some technical issues here <laughs> about uh, about the operation of uh, sure. of of the world and where uh, um, our understanding of physics um, has ha might have a gap in it and so on. Mm. And maybe one could call that a free will. I, I would maintain an open mind when it comes to that right. question okay yeah so william lane craig asked uh sir roger if he believed in free will and basically sir roger said i don't know um but i think either he asked william lane craig and it might be coming up if he thinks his god has free will and i thought that was brilliant that's a great question by the way for any atheist to ask a theist who believes in a monotheistic god if um, this god has free will
Well, then, if this being has elected to create agents with freedom of the will, then it's the not be, true that it's in control but does of everything. The being have the will, have the freedom not to to have all this. Uh, well, could it not um, do that somehow? I think that that's a further question to be explored. It would seem to me that it's the creator of the. Notice he didn't. Craig doesn't have an answer to that question. Yeah. That well, and the difficulty is that if he answers in the in the affirmative that the being does have the freedom to not create, then it um, undermines the um, the claim that it's an explanation, and it undermines the claim that this God is all good. Because an all good God would not create if he knew or predicted what would happen, what we see around us. That's my theory. I. I to me, that seems so incredibly simple and straightforward. I, I don't understand why Christians don't even acknowledge it almost. It's like, well, of course there has to be existence. Just don't even think about it. No, if your God is real, and if he, had a, if he has free will and, and can make choices, and if he chose to do what he did, knowing what would happen or even predicting what would happen, that even just, and if hell's real or just a very bad place is real, or just one baby dies from cancer, and God doesn't need to create, the fact he did makes him evil. Yeah. Am I wrong? Yeah. Well, you, yeah, you call this the, um, you know, the real problem of evil. Yeah. Um, I think the response, of course, would be some appeal to Heaven. a a way in which um, the action brought about a greater good. Um, that's generally what I see in response, but I think that that runs into epistemic issues. Yeah, definitely. It's it's like you almost have to view your God as needy. He has to show his love. He has to have praise, um, because if just one baby suffers from cancer and it didn't need to, by not creating at all, God's happy without creation, right? Or is he unhappy? Is he sad? He needs to create in order to be happy. Physical realm. It would be very easy for this mind to have created a world with no free moral agents in it, a world in which the highest form of life is, say, rabbits, uh, <laughs> and there wouldn't be any free will. But if oh, this... I don't know, maybe rabbits do. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> well, <laughs> however that may be, if this being uh, uh, has elected to create significant moral agents that are endowed with freedom of the will then it means that not everything that happens is controlled by this being in a marionette sort of fashion. Mm. And that would gel, I think, nicely with our experience. I, I think that this gels with our experiences of beauty, of ethical norms and obligations that press upon us, and with respect to our own See, freedom. This is, it, it's so strange to me, like, how Craig can both how he can simultaneously hold the view that we were created by God, for example, in his image, yet it is the case that we came about through some type of process of natural selection over um, millions of years of evolutionary history. I don't think Craig believes that. I think he does. Um, but I think that he probably holds to some form of... Um, like intelligent design he think he probably thinks that god in some fashion intervenes along the way to guide it to humans or something but i actually i mean i don't know i'm just i'm honestly making shit up but he does believe in evolution is I, my understanding. I think he's i think william and craig is a lot like john lennox and john lennox he buys the whole adam and eve thing literal humans first humans um yeah i i think you get a few beers in william and craig and he'll tell you no, no, macroevolution. <laughs> Do you think? I think he's on record saying that he thinks that the genetic evidence. Yes, but is... he, I got that clip and I use it often. But he doesn't actually say his belief. He'll just say the evidence is overwhelming. The genetic evidence is overwhelming that um, that the population of Homo sapiens never got under 20,000 or something like that. that. That's his quote, something like that. But he never says that he accepts that, what scientists say. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. I, if someone in the chat knows of William Lane Craig going on record saying he believes in um, evolution via common descent, let me know. I want to see that. I want to hear it. If it's in print, 
I think he's been cagey his whole life on this one. Doesn't he have a book coming out that attempts to sort of tackle part of this issue I with don't know. you know Christian Christian theology, evolution, and the Adam and Eve story? Yeah, I, but what I want him to say, I, this is what I believe, not just talking about the you know the arguments for and against. Just I want to know his personal beliefs. I don't. He must have a someone has has had to have asked him that in the past, but maybe I've missed it. <laughs> to transcend the physical realm and, and not be simply determined. So this really fits beautifully with our experience, I well, think. What, what would it take, I suppose I'd be interested to know, Roger, what, what would it take to move you from acknowledging the mystery and the depth of, of what what is the reality we live in to to acknowledging a source of the sort that Bill is pointing to? I just, what would it take for us to get you into a new Christian car today? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can, this is the theme of this video. This is, this is not the first time, uh, or not the last time Justin's going to ask that question. And I, it's not a bad question, but it's, if I was Sir Roger, I would ask that question right back at these guys. William Lane Craig, Justin Briar, Briarly, um, what would it take for you to believe that there is no God and that this is just either naturalism is true or are you open to that idea or would that cause a, um, a psychological men mental breakdown? <laughs> just don't see why it's a solution to these problems. I think that's my real issue. <clears throat> I mean, it's a, you can postulate that there is some kind of a, a thing which one could uh, call a god, I suppose, and that that thing is uh, supposed to inhabit this uh, world which is the mental world. To me, that's a hypothesis which I can't quite see what to do with. Mm. I mean, I'm not saying it's wrong. I just can't see why one should attribute this thing, which is somehow the answer to all questions, should inhabit the world of the... Of it it the, sounds uh, like you'd rather have the questions than, than put that sort of a, an explanation to, to the questions. Uh, yes, I, I think, I mean... The, yeah, it sounds, Justin's saying, it sounds like you're you're willing to have those questions and say, I don't know, then have the answers. <laughs> right, which is what I was saying earlier, is that I think that he's not willing to accept a bad answer simply because no other answer is present. Uh, Mind Onion makes a good point that um, William Lane Craig said, young earth creationism is brain-dead Christianity. Yeah, I remember him saying that, but has he ever said whether or not he accepts evolution via common descent or not? That's what I want to know. And Titanicus is saying William Lane Craig denounces evolution in this Hitches debate. Does he? I'm trying to remember. Anyhow. There could be a truth in such a view, but I don't see why I'm driven to believe that. And I don't see mm. why it should be a conscious thing. You see, this is, I mean, it could be. I'm not saying I deny it. Okay. I just don't see the ex explanation, uh, why this explains very much. To, see, to say that this entity, a uh, godlike entity, whatever it is, is something with a consciousness of its own. Not yeah, see, and what Sir Roger's saying here is, I have no need for your God. And this is, I, I, I tell you, I think this really bothers guys like William, William Lane Craig and, and Justin. It's like, what are you talking about? You don't need our God. Like, you don't need this explanation? Come on. Have this existential angst like we do. I'm not saying it's wrong. And it right. might be that there is such a thing. Maybe one, you know, like in, in some religious views, one some uh, after death somehow one's consciousness um, becomes part of that thing. Uh, I'm not saying I think that's a wrong view. I don't necessarily think it's let, a wrong view. Let, let's have one, one response, yeah. and then we'll move on to yeah. some of the specifics sure. of, of cosmology here. I'm not trying to drive anyone <laughs> to a conclusion. I'm offering okay. a, a metaphysical solution to what you admit are profound mysteries. You're not trying to drive people to conclusions, William Lane Craig? Really? Uh, do you buy that, Cam? I'm not buying that. Yeah, I don't really buy that. <laughs> I mean, he was maybe talking about specifically here. I don't. Maybe he means something. Well, he's talking about different by God. God I don't know. He's, he's he has to be talking about a God explaining these mysteries, and and I think if you're a Christian and you believe in any concept of hell, separation from God, that's not good. Uh, and you're not trying to drive people to that conclusion. I think that's disingenuous. You have to say I'm an evangelical. I want you to believe as I do because your eternal destiny is at stake. 
That's what he should be saying if he's an honest Christian. <laughs> in your own worldview, where we have these three disparate realms of reality that don't seem to connect very well. And given that you've already got the mental realm, you've already got the realm You're so close. mind, it's, it? it's a small step to postulate an omniscient mind. But You're almost there to accepting the God I believe in. Why don't we, you see, we've already got the physical world, you see. You could yes. say, why don't we put it there? Well, I already the spoke to world. that. Why don't we put it there? Right, I, so, I already spoke to that so. because <laughs> you can't put it in the abstract realm because that realm is causally a feat. Uh, you can't put it in the physical realm because the physical realm is contingent and well, finite. Issue earlier, but. And therefore cannot explain the logically necessary uh, and infinite abstract realm. And it's very difficult. Yeah, it can't explain argument from ignorance. Difficult to explain the mental realm too on the basis of purely physical causes. But I think we're just saying, you're just saying it's not here and it's not there. It doesn't mean it's in the third place. It might well, not be anywhere. Well, no. Great, good point. No, I mean if there are these three realms of reality, yes. and the unity, the underlying unity, can't be found in two, it follows logically that it's going to be found in the third, unless there is no unity to be but found I think at all. I think the difficulty here for Craig is that this alternate mental that he's supposing is really wholly different from what it is that we consider our own mental reality. So our own mental reality is unlike God's, given in this one fact that it's predicated at least in part on the physical um, and that, you know, this mind is infinite. We don't know what an infinite mind looks like. None of our minds are infinite. And we also so uh, all of our minds are contingent, whereas this mind is necessary. So there are many different properties that this new unknown thing that he's positing as an explanation has. And But we can do that same thing with respect to the Platonic realm. Well, this Platonic object has causal powers, or like we can do that with the with the 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 physical that yeah. the like you know that there is some unknown natural law that produces the mental or like you, you know what i mean like tom like, jump it, says yeah it's um yeah it's um th this is what theists and christians are going to hate but i can make a comment the cosmos is necessary it's not contingent on anything it's necessary it has to exist it's a necessary entity um, I want to play a clip here, and unfortunately, Cam, I don't think you're going to hear it, but this is from Capturing Christianity's um, website. Let me get rid of you. This is uh, the question posed to William Lay Craig here uh, that Cameron asked him was, what is the, uh, what is it? Let me make sure I get it right. What is the, le the argument that you've made that you're least certain about? Let me make sure I got that right. Yeah, I think that's it. What is the argument you're least certain about? And this is what he answered. Oh. <sighs> well, it would probably be one of the arguments for God's existence. Uh, Maybe, for example, the Leibnizian argument from contingency. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> so he was asked, what are all the arguments that you're, you, are the hardest for you to defend or you're least certain about? The contingency argument, the one he's just made, I think, just now. Okay, let me uh, bring you back here. Did you, you didn't hear that, right, Cam? No. You missed a long pause. I don't know if you've ever no. seen it before, but you missed a long pause because it was a great question by Cameron. What's an argument that you're least certain about that you've had to defend? And he basically admits the contingency argument. And because guys like Sir Roger can say the cosmos is, conting is not contingent, it's necessary. And so, anyhow. Oh. Well, maybe the unity is something much deeper than any of these pictures. Well, then it's, you're... It's contained, it has to do more with the, 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 the totality of all three, uh -huh. in some sense, well, then rather than be... putting it in the mental world. Yeah. So the mental, putting it in the mental world is giving it a, I mean, degrading it in a way. I think that's what I feel about it. Feels it feels unbalanced to you yes, in some way. Yes, it's imbalanced, and if it has free will and somehow, yes. then that's somehow degrading it, because oh it says it could somehow have done something else. It's like us. It's too much like us. <laughs> it's it's too much like... like 
like, yeah. putting <laughs> like yes, like old view, ancient views of 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 well, old English, uh, view, the Greek views of the gods in some sense. They were like Which, too much like but us. They were finite. Contingent. <laughs> <laughs> Here we're talking about a metaphysically necessary source of the Platonic realm. And but the physical it, world. This is a. This is not. And, and, and perhaps significantly, the Judeo-Christian traditions, of course, do speak of humanity being made in the image of God. That there is that sense yes, in which, yes. in which we reflect kind of that. I'm having trouble with. Yes. That you're having trouble exactly. with that idea. Yes. 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 Well, well, let's. <laughs> let. It's been yeah. a fascinating conversation already, <laughs> gentlemen. I, I feel, this reminds me of two Jehovah Witnesses, you know, trying to talk to, <laughs> to someone at the door. <laughs> <laughs> I actually talked to some Jehovah's Witnesses the other day. Oh, they came to my door today again. Um, but I'm just too tired to talk, um, and I feel no need. But uh, okay, this is the part, Cam, where he goes into the CCC model for close to 20 minutes. It's up to you. The CCC model is the conformal cyclic cosmology model, and it basically uh, let me bring up um, some pictures here. You, didn't you send me a picture? Maybe you didn't. No. Do you want to explain well, the CC one model? Of the things, uh, one of the things that um, it would be good to capture is where the discussion of um, whether or not time can be understood as some type of absolute thing or whether or not we need to take uh, special relativity uh, seriously and consider instead it to be some type of uh, more uh, relative thing that is dynamic. I am um, quite sure that it's after this part that I'm fast forward. I'm, I'm skipping a lot because if you guys want to watch this, I put the link in the description, but I want to get to the part where they talk more about the, the uh, theology than the, the actual science. But basically, um, Sir Roger, his views are in the minority, granted, but he believes that our universe, the cosmos, th didn't necessarily have a beginning, that basically it's, um, think of a big bang causing a universe, then dying, causing a, another big bang, and just, is that basically right? There's no contraction, it's basically a continual... Yeah, so I mean, the, the, the gist of it is, is that like, it's a, a normal cosmology as we usually stand, understand it in the long run future, the with the heat death of the universe, where all usable energy runs out, and we have black holes that are evaporating via Hawking ra radiation, that at uh, once these black holes have all evaporated, um, uh, there will no longer be like a distinction between um, like effectively what happens is like our notion of time breaks down because of the fact that the universe doesn't have um, things uh, in it in these uh, space time horizons or whatever they call them. Um, like there's effectively, um, I, I can't explain it. I don't understand I, I, it. I, let me, I, I but, think I, but once it gets to that point, uh, there, the, that look looks much like what it looked like at the big, the big bang of our universe. And right. so he has a mathematical model from which at this end state of our universe, there will actually be like a new eon that begins with a new big bang. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's and called conformal cyclic cosmology. Yeah, the CCC model. And the bottom line for Christians is if if Dr. Penrose is correct, if he's correct about this, his model, the Kalam cosmological argument, as used by William, William Lane Craig, it goes poof, oh, gone. <laughs> um, because um, the universe, the, the, the way that William Lane Craig defines universe is the cosmos. It really didn't have a beginning then, or it doesn't have to. It's like... <laughs> When I just I, I want to be cautious once again. It isn't the case that it's that this type of inter eternal universe view or denying of the premise of the Kalam comes about only through the truth of Penrose's model. There are many cosmological models right. that are eternal, not just his. Right. Yeah. I'm I'm just saying that if he's right though. Craig's in trouble with his argument. And yeah. we're going to see this coming up. You're disagreeing yeah. with that. Sure. I, I yeah. mean, uh, we're probably not going to get to the bottom of yeah. this. Yeah. But, but Could I raise an issue that I think do. is more yeah. fundamental? Okay. I noticed that when you spoke of these symmetrical 
um, predictions of a singularity and your work in showing that even in an, uh, a universe that is not isotropic and homogeneous mm -hmm. that these, this singularity would occur. Yes. You spoke of whether or not they were realistic solutions mm -hmm. or not. And I think this is the, one of the fundamental questions to ask about your conformal cyclical cosmology. To what degree do you think this is a realistic depiction of the universe as opposed to a mathematical I think uh, model? I, I noticed in yeah. 2006 you said, so far we regard the conformal space-time prior to the Big Bang as a mathematical fiction. However, my outrageous proposal <laughs> is to take this mathematical fiction seriously as something physically real. Now, I'm yeah. suspicious of that <laughs> outrageous move. <laughs> well, you see, I use the word outrageous as a, as a defense against people who would be saying, that's an outrageous idea. <laughs> yes, yes. I'd already said that. Yes, you admit it. <laughs> because it, it's outrageous in the sense that it's very different from the conventional view. Yes. I don't think it's outrageous. In fact, I, if you ask me now what I think about it, I think it's correct. I think that this is sufficient evidence now, this is very different from those days, mm -hmm. sufficient evidence now to indicate that uh, it makes predictions which are not made mm -hmm. by the conventional view and we actually are be seeing, beginning to see are actually present in, in, in the observations. Now this is, is, is pretty new. Uh, there are things which are a few years old which had to do with signals. You see, I had this view you're going back to whenever it was 2006 or something. Yes. When uh, there was no observational indication mm -hmm. of this particular view, uh, apart from, okay, it seemed to make sense of certain things which were puzzles, which other schemes don't seem to make sense of. I mean, I think I mentioned earlier in the fact that the gravitational degrees of freedom are highly suppressed in the early universe, whereas the others are not. In this scheme, that is explained, whereas in other models of the universe, inflationary cosmology and so on, I don't see an explanation. So, but that's not the point I'm making here. These are subsequent, yeah, I mean, I used to give lectures on this, taking uh, the view that you more or less described, that this is an interesting idea, uh, nobody will ever know whether it's right or not, I'll be able to go on giving <laughs> lectures on this till the, end of, till the end of my time at least, um, without contradiction. But then I started to think, well, maybe there are observations, observational tests. And I began to worry about what is the most violent possible thing, apart from the Big Bang itself. And I was thinking about, okay, I mentioned our collision with the Andromeda galaxy, which will take place eventually, and our black holes, which will feed each other out, and eventually they will swallow each other up, and there will be one fantastically huge emission of energy in a form that we might not even feel if we were pleasant at that time, in the form of gravitational waves, but an absolutely enormous release of energy. And that enormous release of energy will spread out through the universe, but would be detectable in principle by beings in the, in the succeeding eon. Mm -hmm. Now I'm claiming that these things happened in the eon prior to ours, and that the signals produced by these collisions between <coughs> supermassive black holes Doug. It might be worth putting up one of the graphics just to, uh, so the final uh, image that I sent you. Sorry, yes, okay. Um, I said the final picture you sent me, the one without your, your shirt on. But that's not the one. Yeah, I mean, you can reveal that one if you want, but you know, that's really for yours eyes only, buddy. Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. Okay, I think I got it here. This one? No, the the final one that I sent you. That is the the, this one is the different Friedman models. Oh, you may not have downloaded it. Um, it's in that chat. That oh, I, I, I got it. Up. I got it. I got it. Uh, the the incline board. Uh, no. <laughs> the the, Not that the one? next one after that. There's two more after that that I sent you. Ah, yes. Okay. Got it. Oh yeah, this is a great picture. This is even better than the one with you without a shirt on. <laughs> well, that's not hard. 
Okay. So yeah, in this one, this is kind of like an image of what he's talking about at that cosmology where you have these successive big bangs and each of these sort of separate cone looking like things uh, that you see, these are different eons. Um, and so when he's talking about eons, he's talking about these peri- these v- extremely long periods of time from which the beginning of the big bang to the eventual like heat death and the black, uh, the, um, the black holes evaporating via Hawking radiation. And if this was, if you made more of these and you put them in a circle, then it, you can just see it with your own eyes that the, our cosmos, the cosmos would not have a beginning. Well, and I don't actually think that they do like double back on each other. Um, like in a circle, like you were suggesting, I actually think that in, in Penrose's model, um, they like they extend infinitely toward the past and the future. Um, I might be wrong about that, but I, I'm pretty sure that they extend infinitely. They're not a f- um, they're not a finite chain. I think that they're a countable um, infinite. But um, the I think that the cyclic aspect comes by way of the fact that it goes from big bang to evaporated universe to big bang to evaporated universe i think that's where the cyclic word comes from okay can i press play yeah well are these signals are actually observed and with a co- an armenian colleague vahi Guzajan, i wrote an article on this a paper quite independent of ours by some polish colleagues headed by christoph meisner and a more recent paper that they did on this was originally on this uh, s- satellite, which was called the uh, WMAP satellite, which was looking yes. at the microwave background. And then the more refined observations of the Planck satellite were analyzed by this Polish group nice. later on. And they uh, found that with a confidence of 99.4%, these signals were real and not artificial or, or random. So, so you think there's been physical confirmation in that sense of yeah. the, the, the cyclical model and the newer observations of the things which i call hawking points well let's not get into too much more detail there but but bill what what let, let's say you know that that possibly this model could could be a potential sort of way of understanding the universe i suppose my, my question one question i have is d- would that mean it is infinite into the past uh, and would that mean that you kind of avoid the need for a yeah. I div- <laughs> yeah. Billy, what does this mean? Does this mean I have to give up Christianity? Divine sort of starting point or anything Well, like I that? can't resist saying first <laughs> that the, the observational data is underdeterminative. The m- majority of cosmologists uh, don't explain the data through this particular okay. model. Uh, in Maybe. fact, I mean, most uh, cosmologists, as I understand it from my reading, don't think that the entropy ever will disappear uh, the way that this model requires. And um, they don't think that uh, or particle physicists don't think that electrons will decay, uh, so that there will never be just photons. So I don't uh, think they decay either. So that's but you do think they all they disappear, right? No, the, no, no. They the mass. There's a, you, there is a look. I, I mean, sure, the view is not currently accepted by. It. You could tell that uh, Sir Roger was debating in his mind do i explain this to a guy like william and craig yes or not i i thought that i thought that exact thing that he he almost had a moment where he was like well what you just said is not even tracking with the current conversation yeah he you can tell and even i shouldn't psychoanalyze but you can tell even the way he's his hand is on his face right now it's like oh what have i gotten myself into it's like he doesn't understand my model if this is the comment he's making, yeah. Modern cosmologists, and I agree with that. Mm. But they haven't looked, I have had never had any explanation of, let's take the Polish work because they're more explicit about the probabilities there. The Polish work, um, I haven't seen anybody contradict what they've done. I haven't seen any answer to this n- probability confidence level of 99.4. Now this, this okay, this paper was only, uh, came out earlier this, this uh, um, this year, but um, mm-hmm. there was an earlier paper they had, and there's an earlier paper we had. So this is pretty fresh science, 2019. And I and uh, I haven't had anybody say there's anything wrong with it. Mm-hmm. But the point was that the data is underdeterminative. You said that it was 99% sure that the signals were. 
The data on his model is underdeterminative, but the data on his God isn't. <laughs> Real, right? But the question is, what, how do you best explain this imprint? Yes, I would like and to that, see another one. Yeah, right. as, uh, well, yeah, as I, I haven't seen I, one. Well, well, I, I mean, my, okay. my bigger question, as it were, about this is, is um, I suppose it's the question, let, yes. let, let's say that, that, that we are living in this CCC yeah. model. Sure, the, the I think, I think you're right. We should be talking about... Yeah, exactly. Not, yes, the, yes, the, the, sure. I mean, the, the fundamental, perhaps most obvious question is, well, if, if that is the case, where did it come from? Why, why is there yeah. a universe at all? Uh, whatever particular sort of you know reality it takes um i mean because it's necessary justin it's just always existed just whatever answer you give for your god you could give for this I mean, bill i suppose for you the, the 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 big bang cosmology and so on has served to uh, reinforce that idea of of the idea that, that there is a a mind behind the universe that there is a cause yes and, and yes. would would the the cyclical model sort of if it were in, in any way uh, shown to be a, a good representation of reality undermine that, undermine the idea that we have to have a cause behind the Well, universe? it doesn't show that the past is infinite. Uh, it, it only talks about two eons. Um, I'm skeptical again that it's proper to speak of this other universe as existing temporally prior to ours, because if time disappears, then they're not temporally related. You can't say that one is can earlier I, than can I and later. Interject here something? Okay, before he interjects, William Lane Craig says, if time disappears, you can't say one ha happens before another. But yet, doesn't Craig believe that there's before and after with his God before the creation of the universe? That his God had thoughts? I don't know. I thought that he held some kind of like simultaneous view or something and god is eternal I, I don't know enough about his theology um i know I, that he has a book on it um but yeah, yeah I, 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 don't know. I know the conservative I don't christian that way. the conservative christian doctrine usually i don't know how what percentage of christians believe this but usually a lot of christians think that oh once upon a time no sorry there's always been a god but once upon a time, this God made angels and demons, uh, sorry, made angels, and one of the angels uh, fell and became a demon. And there's like battles in heaven and hell and that sort of thing. Yeah. And then, and then, after, after, after all that stuff happens, God created the universe, which led to so, us. Yeah, that, that, stuff's, that stuff's interesting. And I, I think that Roger is going to respond even better than that. Um, but there was one other thing, um, like one other issue. I, I think that it needs to be hammered that Craig shouldn't have this ability to make this move like, oh, my God is actually compatible with the universe being past infinite because he seems to almost bet the whole house on the universe having a beginning and that being a prediction of his God. So he can't have it both ways. Like if it is the case that the universe is past infinite, it falsifies his God, in my opinion, um, though it's not exactly clear how it is that he has that prediction coming from his God in the first place. But um, I think I guess that he just reads the Bible and reads Genesis <laughs> and that that's why the God predicts that there was a beginning. But you see what I mean, right? Because he kind of tries to wiggle out of it if we watch a little bit more of this conversation. Then you see, yes. when you say time disappears, it doesn't, order doesn't, dis that's a temporal order does not disappear. So I think there's a misunderstanding here. If the time, uh, the notion of the length of time may be um, not preserved in a sense, but mm. necessarily, but time order, whether something was before or after, still is preserved in the sense of causal relationships. And that's not affected by the conformal maps. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can squash time or stretch it, but which is, earlier than the, which, which is earlier and which is later is still preserved. Yeah, and I think William Lane Craig actually believes this about his God. So what I'm hearing Sir Roger saying is that time is in weeks and days and seconds and so forth. It, it, doesn't make any sense before the, our universe. However, there's still temporal before and after. And I think William A. Craig would say the same thing about his God, that his God has a thought 
Yahweh, Jesus has a thought, and then he has another thought. And we can say one thought preceded the second thought. And because um, if you don't say that, if you think that, that Yahweh, his thoughts just started when the universe started, when time started, like, and I think a lot of Christians actually do believe this, that one of the properties, one of the, the um, yeah, one of the properties of God's nature is time, that he is in time. He's not outside of time. He's in it. He's bound by it. So, so you're talking that. about the yeah. metric of yes. time. Yes, that's right. As opposed to temporal order of earlier than. By the way, I, I okay, don't that's, think that's, that's Craig's view. Okay. I mean, how does that play in? Craig claims that God is timeless, right? And immaterial. But, I, I'm but not sure. I, I've read some stuff on Craig's view um, about time, but I, I think Craig would say God is personal. And if God's personal, that means he has a consciousness and he thinks. And if he thinks, how can Yahweh be outside of time and make a promise? Doesn't make sense, right? Promises almost involve time, a before and after. I make a promise now for the future that if X happens, Y will happen. And, um, and then, yeah, then you got the whole cosmology of angels and demons that I think most Christians would agree, and even Jews happened prior to the creation of the universe yeah i but i don't know for sure as far as you're concerned to to, to your overall picture of of the idea of the universe being caused yes well by the God. question would be can can it be extended to past infinity yes or not that I would mean, be the sure. question yeah i mean as you say it, there, there, there could have been a first 73 time if you go back then that was the first one you see could yes. you see it's quite interesting because I actually talked about this in the meeting in the Vatican, not so yes. a few years ago. I can't remember who it was exactly, and they came up with what I thought was, from their point of view, the correct answer, namely that uh, okay, suppose this um, infinite succession of eons is the uh -huh. correct explanation of the physical world. Um, sure, God created the whole lot, and and that it, the temporal order of these things was not the important point. Yes, and I, I thought yes. That's from your perspective. That's the right answer. Mm -hmm. Is is that satisfactory to you? Well, that really? would be a different form of the cosmological argument, such as was defended by Leibniz. Leibniz held that even if you have an eternal universe in the past, that doesn't explain why there is any universe yes. rather than why is there something nothing. rather than nothing. Right, yeah. and so for Leibniz, um, the eternality or infinitude of the past was irrelevant to the question of whether there is a metaphysically necessary being that explains why the universe exists. Yeah, but how can you have an eternal cosmos? That means that that eternal cosmos is necessary along next to God, right? Well, I mean, I think that like this, maybe they're like co-eternal or something like that. Well, yeah, I don't they know. would have to, they would have to be co-eternal <laughs> and therefore co-necessary. And the both. problem is, is that these philosophical ideas and theological ideas are not well defined, and that's part of the problem. The difference with physics and the difference with cosmologies is that these are precisely defined mathematical models. There's a substantial difference between them, and that's partly why when Penrose responds to certain things, he uses words like vague. Um, and Sean Carroll made the same accusation against Craig is uh, I think that um, part of the issue with these models is that they aren't well defined. I know exactly what William Lane Craig will do. I figured it out if, and I don't think this will ever happen, but if, for example, it was proven, proven in quotes, that the Penrose model or that the cosmos is eternal in the past, William Lane Craig will, will shift his rhetoric to, well, that just reflects the, cos the eternal cosmos, reflects the nature of Yahweh. That's Maybe. It's just part of Yahweh's nature. So. I'd have to read more of his, of his book. Like He has this book like um, God and Time or something. I can't remember the title of it, um, but... I, I'm well, probably I'm wrong for saying what I said before, that it's not well-defined, because to be perfectly honest, I haven't read enough of his work to be able to say that. But I have listened to a lot of his debates, and in his debates, it doesn't appear to be that well-defined. Okay, I want to get to the fine-tuning part, and then I think it's done. 
can tell the argument as to, as to whether we can establish, you know, the, 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 that particular model. But there is an aspect of it that I'd love to dig into in the, in the final time we have together, gentlemen, which is why, why this particular universe um, and the way in which it appears to be governed by these fundamental constants and forces that seem incredibly fine-tuned to allow for the existence of life to appear at some point. This is often called the fine-tuning of the universe for life. Bill, do you want to very briefly explain from your perspective why you see this as a, a, an interesting argument for the existence of God? Well, in the contemporary literature on fine-tuning, there are basically three explanatory options. Either physical necessity, that these constants and quantities must have the values they do, that it's not contingent, or secondly, um, chance, and the form that this normally takes would be a kind of multiverse hypothesis, mm -hmm. um, and then an appeal to an observer selection, self-selection effect that we can only observe universes that are finely tuned for our existence, so we shouldn't be surprised that somewhere in the infinite multiverse that we should appear um, in such a universe. And then the third one would be design, that there is an intelligence that designed the universe. And Rogers' um, a special contribution, I think, to this has been to place a very significant objection and question mark behind the explanation of the multiverse hypothesis Before. with the self-selection effect. Because if we were just a random member of a multiverse, we ought to be observing a much different universe than we do. Well, that can you explain did you hear what he just said cam that doesn't make sense to me i jumped around a bit but i think that the way that the objection goes is um that uh there are um universes in which conscious observers exist that dominate the probability space but yet in those universes uh, the 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 minds that exist um, don't exist in this uh, universe that has this long history starting from this low entropy past, uh, then proceeding to like a you know more co complex future at which you know humans evolve, etc. Instead, the um, these universes that dominate the probability space are made up of um, minds that are like. You know, it's this, the, the, the entire universe is just like a, a planet with humans on it or, and it came together randomly. And so I think that Craig is talking about how one of the objections that uh, Penrose made, um, perhaps he's misunderstanding it, I don't know, because there's this confusing bit later in the conversation. But, but anyway, that one of the objections is that um, on, the, on this multiverse model, um, we aren't actually what we we aren't a typical observer and that's part of the problem because the way that the anthropic reasoning with respect to multiverse cosmology goes is that the reason why we find ourselves um uh, the reason why the fine tuning problem is solved is because within the um multiverse cosmology we're a typical observer and um also that the laws have to be fixed in such a way that we can exist. Now, the problem is, is that there are all of these different uh, uh, alternate uh, things that are in the probability space where beings that think, etc., exist, but there isn't this like long eternal part, or sorry, this long, uh, low entropy condition in the universe. I'm hearing what Craig say, the universe has to be finely tuned, because if it wasn't, we would see a mess around us, but we don't see a mess around us, so it's finely tuned. But if it's... No, that's not what he's saying. Okay. Well, maybe that's kind of what he's saying, but he, he's saying that, like, um, like, we are not a typical observer in the multiverse. Typical observers actually have just, like, conscious experience and then, like, they poof out of existence because really they were just, like, some um, random collision of particles that came together to produce a conscious observer. Like, the idea is that, like, um, the the initial conditions of the universe of having this extremely low entropy, that particular configuration is really, really improbable versus many other configurations where the entropy is higher, yet there are still uh, conscious observers. But the difference is, is that in those particular 
uh, cosmologies where the entropy is much higher, but there are still observers. Um, the observers like, you know, kind of poof and uh, into existence and then out of existence via these, you know, random bumpings in of molecules. And this is the Boltzmann brain problem that gets discussed in cosmology. Okay, let's, we've got to move on. Let, I want to come to that. I mean, first of all, on this question of fine tuning, which again, we might be worth just spelling out a little bit for, for the audience. Yes. Um, you you've yourself have, have contributed interestingly to this. Um, there, there's a certain um, aspect of, uh, of reality, the initial low entropy distribution of mass and energy. Now, <laughs> yes. without getting too technical at this point, um, this, is, this is essentially the, the idea you were sort of alluding to earlier, that at that very earliest moment, that singularity uh, a big, in Big Bang cosmology, there's an incredible amount of order mm. versus the mm. disorder, the entropy that, that appears later on, that needs to be there in order for a, a life-sustaining universe to be possible. In fact, you put this extraordinary number on it of um, the precision <laughs> needed to be 1 in 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 123, which I'm told is if you were to try to write that down there and you put a zero on every single particle in the observable universe it you still wouldn't have enough zeros on this. Close. <laughs> and 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 so yes. <clears throat> this is mind-boggling stuff but it, it appears it, it appears mm. that as though uh, some some someone as as you know um uh, who was it who said that someone's been monkeying with the physics um hoyle, uh, hoyle <laughs> uh, fred hoyle said it, it looks as though as as, as bill has said some sort of design is there to, to ensure that we we got here now yeah. now what do you what do you say to that, that I, idea well i'm i'm what bothers me is um J justin was speaking for i don't know two minutes there he really didn't need to you, I, justin do you think that dr uh, penrose doesn't know what you're talking about <laughs> yeah, but maybe he's so. doing it for the benefit of the audience but i don't know yeah i guess you see, for those Christians from Alabama, it's not clear to me. I mean, people talk about about um, well, even the mass ratio between the proton and the neutron, and the fact that the neutron is just a little bit more massive than the proton, and it decays that way rather than the other way around, and so on. But but it's it's very difficult to since we only know one kind of life, you mm. see, or one kind of the production of consciousness. It may be very rare. Throughout the universe, we, I mean, the numbers may not all be that all that all that good. You see, you can imagine fiddling with them so that so that there were consciousnesses all over the place. You see, I don't know. You see, we don't know enough about that. And there are some nice examples from science fiction which show different alternatives. So I like the one. Fred. Roger makes a good point there, um, and he doesn't make it explicitly, but there is this like odd aspect about the fine tuning where it apparently is so fine-tuned on the theistic hypothesis and it's fine-tuned in such a way to bring about life, but it does appear to be the case that life is pretty rare. Like, it certainly isn't the case that the parameters are fine-tuned such that the world is teeming with life because what what do we do? Well, we look out with our telescopes and we find that there are these, you know, myriad of uninhabitable worlds and a vast expanse of empty space. Now, um, maybe this is the only configuration that be, could be created to produce life such as ours. But for an infinite, all-powerful God, it seems a little bit weird that if we were the intended byproduct of his creation, that he couldn't just create a dome world with a flat earth and, you know, like a little terranium or whatever they call them with humans running around inside it. Like, it seems a little bit strange that, like, the way in which God needed to tinker with his design was such that you get this massive enormous universe of tremendous scale what, mostly full of void and black holes and dark matter um, what, what do you think of this i just thought of this uh today actually to to grant the christian fine-tuning and say yes the universe was fine-tuned but just not that well if god would have fine-tuned it better we would have way more life in this universe but he did fine tune it just really badly. I'm thinking like kind of give it, give them what they want, but just let them know how bad it is. <laughs> right. And I think that their response to that is something along the lines of, um, well, how can you say it's bad? Like we came about, right. You know, and we were the end goal and we did come about 
Why is it that all of this other stuff makes it such that it's bad? Why is it that you assume that God's goal would be that the universe would be teeming with life instead of it just being on this lonely little blue planet um, through this process of evolution by natural selection? Now, the problem here is that it becomes a little bit confusing when trying to understand what God's intentions were. Because if we're attempting to use our observation of the external world as a means to figure out, well, what did God God intend to create? What did he fine tune this place for? Well, I mean, he seems to have fine tuned it for things other than us. If we're going by like, you know, the, um, you know, wh why do we, why do we imagine that it isn't the case that God really just wanted lots and lots of black holes? Maybe like the, in the internal dynamics of black holes, there's something incredibly interesting to God going on. And we're just, you know, not privy to it because we just don't have that epistemic access. But we assume that it's all about us, right? You know, it's and that's why Richard Feynman said that, like, the, the view of God seems to be so parochial. Like, it's so, um, you know, this was created all for us. <laughs> question, question for you. What is better than one person worshipping God? <laughs> um, I two, two people worshiping two people God. worshiping God. What's better than two? Three. So if if this was fine tuned for life, and God wants people to worship Him, He would have packed this universe with life. But what do we see? But maybe God doesn't really like to be worshipped all across the universe. Maybe He just likes the little blue dot worshiping Him because it makes Him Him feel special. <laughs> oh, that's blasphemous. <laughs> Fred Hoyle's idea of the the black cloud, you see, where this was a completely different way of imagining a conscious being, okay. which was this huge cosmic cloud which uh, communicated, I guess, by electromagnetic signals and things like this. The other story which I like to r refer to is, is one um, by Robert Forward, which was a uh, uh, dragon's egg, I think was the name of the story, where there was a neutron star which came close to the sun, and uh, the people on the Earth went to explore it, and it turned out that there were living beings on this neutron star, which instead of using chemistry, they used nu nuclear processes. Mm. And this means that their lives and evolution took place millions of times faster than us. Mm. And how you can make a story with this complete imbalance <laughs> was an amazing achievement, I yes. thought. But, but, but they even had a religion which took place in, in the Chilas, which were the inhabitants of this neutron star. And when the Earth was then came close to them. They built their complete religion on, mm. on the star, which appeared, you see, in, in the So do, in the do you sky think it's, it's, I mean, these are obviously stories, but do you think yes. it's possible in a sense that some sort of conscious reality could exist uh, even in the absence of the physical sort of well, carbon-based life that we, we obviously need? For it could have been done very differently in a different, a totally different, you see, there are many different parts of the, of the universe where the physics is very different from what it is on the Earth, and maybe a different kind of life could have evolved there, and uh, I have no idea. Yeah. I just that we don't know. Yeah, if you're an atheist and you're you're talking to a Christian and they bring up the fine tuning, just ask a simple question like, is God bound? Is God limited by the physical constants of the universe? In other words, could the mass of an electron be different and still could he have created life? They're going to have to say yes because they believe that yeah. God is big. <laughs> It's like a cosmological view, uh, sorry, a cosmological version of the euthyphro. Like, are the constants what they are because, um, well, I, actually, I don't know quite how to formulate it, but it's this idea that, like, um, is God, um, does God have to set those constants the way that they are because of something external to him that he's constrained by? Or does he have arbitrary choice over which constants that he chooses? Now, if it's the case that he's constrained by something external to him, then I think that it's kind of this weird lowering of God where, um, like, you know, God is actually constrained by something. Yes. But if it is, like, for example, constrained by mathematics or something, but if it is the other way, then it isn't the case that there's any fine tuning because the parameters are arbitrary. Yeah. The fine tuning argument weakens the omnipotence of Yahweh. I really think so. I think whenever a Christian uses it, there's a song I used to sing in, when I was a boy in Canada about. Uh, my God is so big, so strong, and so mighty, he can fine-tune anything he wants. <laughs> I forget how it goes, something like that. Well, that's hilarious. There are puzzles right. uh, which look like coincidental things, 
Now, they were one of the first ones was Hoyle's thing mm -hmm. about the uh, energy level of carbon, which mm -hmm. hadn't been there. <laughs> then then uh, you couldn't have got beyond the evolution. Well, of uh, Bill, what's your response to the, these sorts of ways of dealing with the fine tuning? Well, this is fascinating to me because as I understand you, Roger, you're not advocating either physical necessity nor chance via the multiverse hypothesis and self-selection effect, uh, nor design, but rather you would simply deny the fact of fine-tuning no. altogether, that the universe is not fine-tuned. It's not denying uh, for I think deny is too strong. I, say I don't know. You don't know. Yeah. And um, to me, that is um, highly implausible. Uh, I, we just find example after example of fine-tuning in contemporary physics, and it seems to me to be a desperate expedient to deny that it exists. Um, in the absence of fine-tuning, there wouldn't... Yeah, and if it was fine-tuned better, Billy, we would have more life. It wouldn't be matter. Um, See, this is, I think, the way you respond to the comments like that. It's just obvious our universe has been fine-tuned. Yeah, give it to him. Yeah, it's fine-tuned, but it uh, could have been way better. Uh, there wouldn't be chemistry. So the idea that, that other so forms of life would evolve, I think, is... Um, logically possible but it's not i think the most plausible solution to the problem well i mean we just know so little about what constitutes life mm -hmm. and how it i mean we we have the universe we have and you could imagine chain, fiddling with the numbers and making them to what extent that freedom is even there mathematically isn't clear i i, I think we just know i mean i can see the arguments and i can see there's a case for the arguments yeah. to say that okay from certain points of view it looks as though there are accidental things about the constants of nature which have allowed things to happen which if they hadn't happened we wouldn't be here and that's true but maybe some other thing would be here which could mm -hmm. have it's not yeah okay i'm on a <clears throat> are you having trouble at hearing is it cam no i was just trying to listen in on your version of it coming through your mic okay um, so i'm not out of time <laughs> okay this is the last part i'll slow it down to one x so go back to the other one and um and this is the final push for of Justin and William Lane Craig in their desperate attempt to get uh, Sir Roger to become a Christian. Let me fast forward it a little bit. Oh, just can, can I share something? Um, it's a personal testimony. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> That's what I was thinking. <laughs> so when uh, Richard Carrier debated William Lane Craig, he tells this anecdote about how I think after the debate, they were driving him to the airport or something like that or driving him somewhere. And uh, William Lane Craig like begins like, I think he might have used the word creepy, <laughs> creepily witnessing to him in like the back of this van. <laughs> Like going really heavy on him, kind of like a you know, like an intervention style. Um, and it Billy was doing this to Carrier. Yeah, yeah, and this set up with um, with Penrose being witnessed to by Briley and Craig reminded me a little bit of that. Yeah, it's corner. <laughs> well, yeah, listen to this. Cause you to cross the line from from mystery to perhaps there really is a. You, Roger, I sort of hinted at this at the beginning, but is there anything that would sort of cause you to cross the line from from mystery to perhaps there really is a, a divine mind behind all this incredible order, complexity, and you know the, the unfathomable uniqueness of who we are in this this universe? Gosh, well, you know, I mean, somebody could, you know, some divine thing could appear, and <laughs> and I could uh, have heal and amputee in the name of Jesus. That's what, it, that's, I think, uh, Sir Roger and, and myself and Cam, we would all be, uh, our confidence would be raised probably high enough to believe. Have a, a vision of something or other. But then you say, would I trust that? Well, quite. I'm not sure <laughs> whether that would convince me about I that. Mean, you see, it's not quite, it, it's more, I don't think it's more, could one twist the views about what I think? You see, I don't have a clear view about mm. an, an overreaching, an overarching, um, picture of, of what's really going on in mm. all this and I do say okay maybe there's I talk about the three mysteries of the connecting the worlds but there's a bigger mystery which is what on earth the whole thing all about you see and it's just that I'm not 
disagreeing with in a way on that question, but but I'm not quite sure to say there's a there's a sort of um, mind which is supposed to answer these questions. It's really an answer to it. I, d- I don't find that satisfying. This, this reminds me a little bit of uh, William Lane Craig trying to witness to uh, Ben Shapiro. And who was the other guy? There's another Christian came on. Not sure. Yeah. But it was like, oh, man, if we could only get Ben Shapiro to change his, his ways from Judaism to Christianity. You know, he has such a big following. We could do so much good in the United States. I mean, your, your colleague Hawking was certain at the time he passed away that there would be nothing on the other side to greet him. <laughs> what, what, I mean, if, you, if it were the case that you found that there was a divine mind... What, well, put would, it like that. If there was somebody on the side, other side to, to greet me at the, at, when I get reach my end, I don't believe that experiences can continue. You see, because one's, one's memories, you see, one's experiences involve one's memories and mm. all that stuff. And uh, I can't imagine coming as some other being later and having the same experiences as I've had and so on. That doesn't quite make sense to me. But whether experience in some abstract sense can continue is, is another question. Right. And you're open to that possibility, or yeah. <laughs> when every, if you're an atheist or a non-believer, non-Christian, whatever, if you ask this question, are you open to that possibility? Yeah, answer yes, of course, and have be ready to give specific examples of what would change your mind. But then ask that question right back. I'm reminded of um, oh, what's that YouTuber's name? I did a video on him. He's a African American fellow, a par. Uh, the beat, the beat by Alan Alan Parr, and I he I did, we did a live stream of him while he was live streaming, and then somebody told him and and I invited him onto my show, and I saw him type in the live stream, no, I'm not going to go on Pine Creek's channel because he is not open to the gospel. I feel he's not open. He's I feel he's not willing to look at the truth. Something like you're that. You're not easy prey. You're not easy prey, Doug. That's what he's trying to say. But but the, my point is that it's so lopsided, so one-sided. Christian, can you not hear that when you, if you're a Christian who ever says that, uh, why should I bother with Doug? Because he's not open to changing his mind. He's not open to the truth. Blah blah blah. Are you open to? Are you Christians? Are you open to the idea that you do not possess the truth? Are you open to that idea that Jesus is not the truth? Really? Are you open to that idea? Like, I have a feeling that the Christian response to that question would be, this is Satan trying to deceive me, and they run for their lives. They run for the hills. It's like, we've got to protect this belief. Not all Christians would do that, of course, but Christians like Alan Parr would, I think. It's like, they're just so certain that they have the truth. And, um, and you can see it in here in Justin's eyes. It's like, I want to help you, Sir Roger. You, you're... You're lost, and you're a smart guy, and all you're so close. You're willing to entertain the Platonic ideas of math, and would you like to know Jesus? <laughs> it's like you could, I could just see this in their brains. You should have Justin on at some stage. You should. I wonder if he'd come on. I can talk to him in uh, was it ten days because he's going to be uh, just six hours away. He's going to be in uh, L.A. Seven hours away. Should I go talk to him? Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> the thing is, if I were to talk to a guy like Justin uh, or John Lennox, whoever's going to be there, their time is short. Like, if you don't like get an interview s- set up ahead of time, the most you can ask for is maybe five, ten minutes. And what, what can you really discuss in five, ten minutes? Like, uh, I would ask the poof or drown question. I would try to pit their moral intuitions against Yahweh's and see how they deal with it. And, um, yeah. But what time is it in New Zealand? Uh, 5.33. PM. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm going to start the music. I want to keep, keep this under two hours. Oh, that's a shame. Why? Um, that was the end. William, what? Don't we have William Lane Craig waiting in the wings? 
Oh yeah. <laughs> he is. He's he's waiting to come on, but we ran out of time, Cam. <laughs> I apologize to William Lane Craig. You were supposed to come on tonight, but I guess we can reschedule. He's listening right now. He's in the room. Uh, in my uh, peer room here. All I would have to do is click a button and he would be here talking, but I really don't think we should go on. Like, it's been close to two hours. Yeah, I think maybe I'll just have a private conversation with him to bring yeah. up my objections. I don't even know if I wanted to have a private conversation with William Lanker. <laughs> but you can. <laughs> you can. A boring one. <laughs> Bye! People who donated and I've missed you. I think um, there's been a couple of you who made some donations and I missed it last time. My apologies. I do appreciate it. And if the universe did not have a beginning, if the cosmos did not have a beginning, Believe your belief in God. That's a great question to ask believers. I would love to hear William Lane Craig's response. Yeah, maybe I should ask Justin that. I always say it would be fun if, uh, if there is a God, we get to heaven and we say, Great job, God on the cosmos. And he goes, What? Cosmos? I didn't make that. That wasn't me. <laughs> Poof. Have a great weekend, everyone.